I was invited to come and speak to you, uh, and I'm going to speak about the role of education in general in the promotion in, of mental health, in the prevention of mental disorders, and in the treatment of people who are unfortunate enough to have them. So uh, uh, I know this is uh, not strictly within your field, but I hope it will be of interest to you, because I think education plays such a tremendously important role in everything that we are doing in the field of mental health. And here is the five areas that I'm briefly addressing. I'll say what could education do to prevent the occurrence of mental disorders, and then speak about the way in which education can help people who have the illness already, uh, maybe also about the rehabilitation of people who had an illness, and then the way in which uh, education can help to promote mental health. And promote in this particular sense means really changing the position which mental health on the scale of values of people, how high it is, and to what an extent it can be promoted. Now, there is a variety of uh, areas in which uh, we are unfortunately missing terribly important chances that could be used to, pre to prevent mental disorders. It is not uh, generally accepted nor generally believed that the uh, prevention of mental disorders is possible. Yet, if you look very carefully, it is quite easy to see that not less than 50% of all disorders, of mental disorders, can be prevented by primary prevention. That is, by, not by secondary prevention, but by primary prevention, uh, preventing the occurrence of these disorders altogether. And here are some of the uh, uh, elementary uh, tasks that one could undertake to prevent mental disorders. One of them is the education of parents about upbringing of children. There's a very small number of countries, and within those countries, a very small proportion of people who are becoming parents who have any training about what it means to be a parent, uh, what it means to cope with the parenting tasks, both for a child that is well and for a child that is not well. And in a way, it is a curious omission, particularly in countries in which the number of children is very small, but it's unfortunately true everywhere. I think the upbringing of children as such, of course, is currently uh, under the influence of a variety of other processes that go on, such as, for example, a significant reduction of the number of hours, of days, of time that parents bring with their children. Uh, they are getting the time that they are spending together is lesser and lesser. It's estimated that in most European countries, the time with the parents per day is no more than one and a half hour. Uh, which is a very low part. What has happened in the meanwhile is a significant influx of, sub, um, of uh, surrogate parents, various nurses and very often Filipinos or others who come. In some countries, it is uh, the surrogation or the uh, replacement of parents is having curious results. In Saudi Arabia, for example, you will find that many children do not speak Arabic because they have been brought up by Filipino nurses and they speak very good Tagalog, but they speak no Arabic whatsoever. Now, not speaking the language of your parents means much more than not only speaking the language. It means being with foreigners in your house, being in strange relationship, with no transmission of the values, with no transmission of ways of coping in a particular society. And that is something that is a terrible loss. But it's a fortunately happening everywhere that you go. Highly educated parents very often pass on the task of educating their children. And a uh, child that grows in a house of, I don't know how many, well-educated, very able parents uh, is educated by uh, sometimes an uh, illiterate and very often not a terribly healthy person either. Then I think that the other areas in which education could help is the education of teachers uh, about avoidable risks. Um, of mental illness. And one of the classical, most simple examples is the correction of sensory deficit. Minor deficit, not big deficit. For example, minor uh, problems of hearing, which will very often be interpreted by those who haven't recognized it as being the child not listening, or the child being uh, um, misbehaving, or doing its own, and a variety of other interpretations. And yet, uh, in many countries, you will find that one out of 17 children is being recognized as having mild hearing deficit, not big hearing deficit, but milder hearing deficit, which lead in the course of time, not only to that, but the teachers who 
uh, never tested the hearing of these children, uh, will in fact gradually get uh, convinced that this child never listens, it never obeys, it is never participating, and very soon these children are at high risk for becoming dropouts from school. Same with the visual deficit. While short-sightedness is usually diagnosed very quickly and very well, uh, hypermetropia, that is a, a capacity to read uh, uh, far away but not close by, uh, is not recognized very often. And approximately one quarter of all children who are diagnosed as having dyslexia are in fact having problems of hypermetropia. They are not able to read, and the first thing that happens, they are sent to a dyslexia teacher, the dyslexia expert, who very often starts giving them treatment, uh, but uh, uh, misses the point altogether. So the correction of sensory deficit could significantly reduce the dropouts from schools but it doesn't, it's not happening. In Pakistan, for example, we have seen that up to 10% of children have only 50% vision because of sensory deficit, corrigible sensory deficit with glasses, and the glasses which currently cost $0.7 a pair. They are printed glasses, couldn't put on the face, but they are not done. Less than a bottle of Coca-Cola. And on the other hand, you have a dropout from school and uh, all the consequences that drop off, dropping out from school may, may mean. So I think that there are avoidable risks that one could do. And a very important point would be also to teach the teachers not to recognize mental disorders, but to deal with them. How to deal with a problem when they see a child which is stubborn or a child which is not behaving as it should be. What can I as a teacher do rather than recognize him and send him to go and see somebody else who is a, a, an expert in dealing with these kind of problems? So I think that there are a variety of uh, other things that teachers could be taught and could be helping and perhaps the most important of all and it should be a chief subject for any education in any school it is to teach people not to discriminate and not uh, to reject people who are different uh, because it's in fact in school that this happens and they, so many of the teachers who now refuse to in fact participate in that effort to think about ways in which a disabled child or mildly disabled child can be received and accepted, although the disability might exist. Some countries have made a great progress in that respect, but many have not paid any attention. Now, uh, treatment of mental disorder is another area of great importance, and of course, and there again, I think it would be very possible to see the education entering in a different, in a different way. One of them is the uh, education of uh, all health workers in all educational workers about uh, what one would call first aid in mental health. Uh, a program that has been developed in Australia shows that uh, uh, people who are in the general population can learn a number of things which in fact are similar to the first aid in physical health but this time in the field of mental health. And the program of first aid mental health has been immensely successful particularly in some areas, for example, where relatives are being given that course and uh, where relatives, uh, caretakers, are being educated. The problem with looking after somebody else is that your own health goes to hell. That you have a high proportion, of, you in fact see that people who have somebody who is mentally ill in their family will have a very high, much higher uh, rate of visiting health services, not for mental disorders, but for physical illness. Uh, maybe in an area where you have somebody who has a, uh, in a family who has a uh, agitated depression uh, or a um, dementia, you will find that the rate of visiting for physical health uh, is about twice as high in people who are relatives. And equally so, that the life, the duration of life, the life expectancy of caretakers can be extended by appropriate training about ways of looking after someone else. So carers have to be educated about mental illness in a way that is much more in acceptable, much more uh, simple than it is at present often done. Uh, we are now very often seeing that a person who is, uh, has a mental disorder is now placed into the family. And there's practically no paper in the world which has decently described what are the minimal requirements for a family to be able to accept somebody who is disabled. It's not written. Uh, so, what happens is when a person from mental illness or in another way disabled is discharged from hospital, the family as such is very often not properly uh, assessed 
maybe if a family has a, a small child at home, can it really accept a person with dementia back into the house or not? And I think that every country will have different rules about it, but the main point which I'm making is not that, the, that we know the, all the answers, but that we should think about what are the minimum requirements for a family to be an appropriate receptor of a person with a mental illness, number one. And number two, what help does that family need in order to perform that, regardless of their health? Wonderful work has been done by Annelise Dupont some years ago in which they looked at the children with mental disorders, mental learning difficulties and learning impediments, in which she has not looked so much at the health, but she looked at the time budget of the mothers to see what did the mothers do with their time and in order to discover that uh, uh, these mothers have stopped reading newspapers, they stopped having sex with their husbands, they stopped in going out to, uh, tail, to, to um, a hairdresser, they stopped going out to shops, nothing. Their whole world was in fact on one particular. And the fact that they had such a life was to a large extent avoidable, as uh, Annelise Dupont has done, by organizing a short-term uh, common care for these children which allowed mothers to have two times three hours a week and it changed their life uh, by an arrangement of that type. I think one another area that is of tremendous importance in the education is thinking about reducing the stigma of mental disorders. Stigma of mental disorders is without any doubt the most serious obstacle to development of programs of any type. It is present now, people lie about it, but they are having it, and it is not only present to the individual who has the illness, but everything that touches him. People who are treating mental illness are stigmatized. Medications which are used for the treatment are stigmatized. An example, clozapine was one of the drugs that was introduced, and it does produce one times in 3,000 an agranulocytosis, a serious blood problem. So, everywhere in the newspapers, take care of this particular drug because it does this thing. At the same time, another drug, this time an antibiotic, was uh, being put on the market with 18 times more of the same kind of problem, never mentioned anywhere. It is the drug which was used for mental disorder, which had been stigmatized together with everything else that touches mental illness. And keeping in mind that teachers and other educational uh, authorities can do a significant amount to reduce the stigma of mental illness and the stigma of other, uh, others who are hit by that illness is also of great importance. And I think of great importance in thinking about how to reduce stigma is not to do it ourselves if you are well, because we do not understand everything that is present in illness. So if people with a lived experience of mental illness can be extremely good teachers. They speak about their own experience and they tell you things which you never thought about. And I think that the gradual introduction of family members and of uh, patients, ex-patients, who teach medical students, who teach nurses, who teach teachers and others about what it means to be ill and the way in which this illness can in fact be reduced in its consequences is something of great importance. The same is true for uh, rehabilitation. Fortunately, we are not talking anymore about rehabilitation because we are gradually understanding that the word recovery is a much better word. Uh, rehabilitation somehow indicates that you are returning the person to a position that he previously had. But many of the people with mental illness never had a position. So to talk about returning them is not... You have to create a new life for many of these people. And the idea of creating a new life and somehow in introducing into the population as a general that you should in a way live with what you have and use to a maximum what the capacities there are is something that is of tremendous importance. And again, here as uh, well as elsewhere, it is very important to think about the use of people with lived experience in teaching, thinking about also that uh, a number of other people have to be taught about the new concepts in the field of rehabilitation, which at present is not the case. And equally so, one should probably think of ways in which one can educate the community to be differently receptive to people who have a mental illness or people who have a mental incapacity. I think that uh, uh, the staff of inpatient facilities should also think twice before discharging somebody into the community. Maybe in a highly developed country such as Norway that is not important. But uh, 
it is non certainly something that is of tremendous importance because it is not happening in most countries of the world. Now, education also has an important role to play about in, in the uh, medical interventions of any type. And I'm listing here some of those uh, which are at present forgetting that every single intervention that you might have in the field of medical uh, interventions is related with psychosocial factors that define the way in which uh, the education, the way in which people behave later on. And I think I've listed here some of the examples. The public health officers who very often are not sufficiently aware of the uh, changes that happen in a family when a person with a mental illness is appearing in, as a member of that family and the whole range of other people who are involved and who are responsible for uh, planning and continuing to plan for health care to learn how to what changes it, uh, are necessary or changes happen when people with a mental disorder, mental disability uh, or any other uh, um, similar state are introduced into the care. Particularly uh, um, important people in that case would of course be primary health care staff. But primary health care staff have one dominant idea and very often if you teach them how to deal with a person who has a problem, uh, the, the main thing is how to recognize it. And we've done this in a number of places. We've taught them how to recognize mental disorders and the only consequence of being able to recognize was that they sent them away. They referred them to someone else. They did not want to do it. And many of the general doctors will say, we are not wanting to treat this. This is for psychiatrists to deal with. It's not for psychiatrists to deal with. Psychiatrists at best, in my opinion, should be an advisor to much more other people who are in fact in daily contacts who have to take on 90% of the care for people with mental illness or disabilities. And that is equally true for other branches of medicine of people who are very often not recognizing the tremendous importance and the way in which they can use the psychosocial and the psychological uh, power that resides in people to make them feel better. Most recently, there is a, uh, uh, what has been an innovation, a new word has been created. It's the word syndemic. The word syndemic speaks of an epidemic of diseases which appear together and worsen the prognosis of both. So that, for example, if you look at the number of people with diabetes, uh, it is known that people with diabetes have about twice to three times more depressive disorders than people without diabetes. But when those two diseases come together, it's not only that they are comorbid together, but they worsen the prognosis significantly of both diabetes and of depression. So that you get twice as many complications of different type in the people with diabetes, which are lifted up if you deal with the depression, and yet, it's not done. We have done a study just recently completed, published, uh, in which we looked at certain countries to see to what an extent people who are working in diabetic services recognize the presence of depression in patients whom they are treating. And we asked them, uh, we did the examination of about 3,000 people and looked to see and we found that yes, there is approximately 15, 12 to 15 percent of the people who come to the diabetic service also had a depressive disorder in the last year. It's not an unusual finding. It's about twice as frequent in people with diabetes than it is in people without diabetes. But the problem which we really found in that study is that less than 1% of these outstanding facilities has ever recorded that depression was present or that any treatment was provided. So that they passed through the diabetic service and given first class service for their diabetes, but they did not, in fact, deal with a problem that was obvious and could have been dealt with. And the same is true for many others. And as comorbidity is growing everywhere, uh, it's really an obligation to fight for something that would bring together. Because at the same time, while comorbidity, that is the common presence of more than one illness, one physical, one mental, is growing, at the same time, medicine is being fragmented into ever smaller pieces. So that you have surgeons who deal with one particular problem only. I'm a surgeon of the left hand. Oh, I'm dealing with a fing this finger and this finger. These are the two fingers I'm very good at. What about the body? No, I don't care about this. I'm dealing with two fingers. That's my, my thing. And I'm making a lot of money doing it too. And whether this person up there on the other side of the hand is suffering or um, 
having a depression or uh, whichever else. I don't really care. That's not my business. I am dealing with the fingers. And I think that that development of an ever more fragmented medicine with a simultaneously ever increasing number of comorbid states leads medicine into a very bad, bad direction. More so, as the life expectancy is increasing, every year that is of life expectancy brings more diseases to appear together. And uh, the phenomenon which is currently not recognized very well is that, in fact, uh, the life expectancy extension which we are now witnessing is not giving you any free of disease years. Although the life expectancy has increased 10 years, those 10 years are not disease-free. They are disease-full years. And having the extra burden of people who are surviving with more than one illness places a responsibility before medicine and before education to do something about this phenomenon which was never present in the past. Now, promotion of mental health is a, uh, interpreted in various ways. One way of interpreting promotion is to say that promotion is improving the mental health. So you are not able to count to 1,000, but to 10,000, for example, or some such great improvement of mental health. Uh, promotion can also be seen as treating mental illness. But the main, uh, really, uh, essence of promotion is to place mental this, uh, health at a higher position on the scale of values. You have a variety of things in your scale of values, patriotism uh, and various other things. And mental health is very low on the scale of values. And to lift it up there would be of tremendous importance because by a more uh, highly respected, highly valued mental health, so many more things would suddenly become possible. And I think that it's important to remember that the formal education in schools could have a tremendous effect on the scale of values and where you place mental health. What is more important? Is it more important to be rich or to be mentally ill or mentally healthy? Which, which one is the two? And very often you will find that people, in fact, put mental health and this protection and promotion at a very low, low level at all of it. And I think that uh, uh, it's not easy to raise the promotion, to promote mental health to a higher scale, because it requires something that is often not exist existing, which is the collaboration of all the different parts, participants, in creating a value system. That is the media, the schools, the parents, the teachers, all of these people who in fact create this value system that the person carries until the end of his life. And of course that will vary from one place to another, but it's a task that has not been recognized. We are still letting these value systems to become, to create themselves by television or by various other things without really worrying about the fact that we should have a proper value system because that will allow us to create people who will be better members of society. Now, what should people in uh, education do? The first one, I think, is thinking about the ways in which teaching is done. Because if you go today to medical schools and you look how teaching is done in most medical schools, you see it's done wrongly. It's done wrongly in many ways. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one of the things that one would expect will be a central part is to teach people in the field of medicine how to speak. Because many of them, when they are put anywhere to speak, they speak badly. They, you put them on television to speak, they have five minutes, everybody in the world will listen to them. In those five minutes, do they use them well? No. They speak, you know, they, they watch their pencil, they, you know, they mutter away. Nobody's ever taught them how to speak to public. Nobody's ever taught them how to convince others about what they want to do. And there's a number of similar social skills which should be introduced into medicine and into education both, so as to be able to use the opportunities when you can influence others to do so. And I think that that capacity to teach others without telling them that you are teaching them uh, is something that is of tremendous importance and currently not being done. Now, of course, one has to think that this education about mental health should involve everybody that is in this field. These are people, members of the family, who can be superb teachers of others. 
they know a great deal. People who look after mental illness, they spend 24 hours a day for days and days and days with, these, with the people who are disabled, and they know much more than anybody else. They're a much better teacher about that. I mean, sorry, they know much more and could be much better teacher than anybody else, but they are not currently being used. And if they are used, they are not properly helped to learn how to teach, which would be very important. People with mental illness, we have done in our programs against stigma, we have had schools of people with mental illness to teach them how to speak about their illness. And they are outstandingly good speakers. Not only that, when they have spoken about it in the right way, they come and they feel a little bit better because they've done something that is valuable and they feel encouraged by what has happened. And of course, everybody else, community workers, etc., would have to be involved in that as well. Now, what should we teach about mental health? I think these are the five things that I would think are probably priority topics for education about mental health. Self-help. Instead of teaching people the names of kings, you should teach them how to uh, problem-solving techniques. So that some of the problems which appear, they can solve themselves, starting at elementary school and going throughout. Self-help is tremendously important. It's not self-suffering as has been until now. You must tolerate more. No. You can resolve problems, and problem-solving technique is a particular one that can be learned very quickly and should be taught in the first class of elementary school and throughout, even if you don't remember the kings of your country for, uh, as one would currently do. Second, how to prevent stigma and discrimination, another topic of tremendous importance. If you could diminish the discrimination that is input into the mind and into the hearts of people, you would have a much better and easier chore later on. How to work with other people. A tremendously important thing, we are not taught about that. We are, sometimes people will learn it and are very good at it, but many often they don't. You don't teach what it means to work with other people. And yet, it's, possible, it's very easy to teach it. And you can show it. And you can start in elementary school. You put people together and learn how to do it. Uh, I mentioned already communication skills and social skills. And of course, some facts as well. Teaching facts alone is not helpful. To speak about schizophrenia to people uh, in a village is not particularly helpful because people have what is called selective memory and selective perception. That is, you speak about that, they will only remember things which are in harmony with their prejudice and all the rest they will avoid. So that it's not the right thing to do. You should, in fact, think very carefully about where and whom to teach about mental disorders. So, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening to me. I think that education plays a tremendously important role in every aspect of mental disorder treatment and prevention. I think that the education can have an impact which is both negative and very positive. And to thinking about very carefully what should be the goals that we should pursue, uh, I think is a first step. And uh, as I say here, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a first step. Today, maybe, is the day to take that step. Thank you.